Thank you, Julie. So um, I would like to thank uh, uh, Christian for the invitation first, and uh, also for the proposed um, uh, presentation, Diagnostics and Emergence Potential. The association may sound a bit bizarre, but it's, it's, it's interesting, really. Um, So I will start with emergence potential of these arboviruses with quite general inform information, trying to, to keep a, a wide vision of, 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 of the problem. Um, if we look at what happened during the last two decades in terms of emergence, you have is here um, a list of the most striking emergence events, and here a complementary list. So here you have West Nile, of course, um, in, in the US, you have SARS coronavirus, you have Chikungunya, first in the Indian Ocean, you have the, the flu pandemic, H1N1, then you have MERS, then you have Zika in French Polynesia, then New World, then you have Chikungunya again, this time in the New World, and you have Ebola in, in West Africa. It's not exhaustive, but they are the most striking ones. And you have some additional uh, emerge re-emerging pathogens, such as dengue, of course, everywhere, yellow fever that we has been evoked, T-bone encephalitis virus in, in Eastern uh, Europe, Alcuma virus in Saudi Arabia, um, Enterovirus 71 in, in Southeast Asia, and potentially uh, less documented uh, viruses like Powassan in the US, Toscana virus in, in, in North Africa and, and South Europe, and uh, Rift Valley fever virus. Well, the interesting thing here is that um, in, in red you have the arboviruses, and in, in gray the yellow viruses. It doesn't mean much comments. Arboviruses are extremely present in this. Uh, emergence events over the last two decades. On the right panel, you have the same em emergence events, and in red, you have the true emergence events, the viruses that were um, identified for the first time, this is SARS and MERS, and all the others, more or less, are re-emerging events, viruses that we knew before and that re-emerge. And also, I think it's very clear, we have a few emergence events and a lot of re emergence events. So if we are short of time, I may stop here because the big conclusions, <laughs> the big conclusions are there. Um, can conclude first that yes, there is specific importance of arboviruses among uh, emerging pathogens. This is true regarding the number of emergence events. This is true regarding the, var the, the variety, the variability of, of, of the pathogens, a lot of different uh, arboviruses implicated, and this is also true regarding the number of patients um, concerned. We are talking more than one billion over the period, okay? So e enormous thing. And the second um, uh, lesson is that re-emerging pathogens represent the greatest part of the public health burden of e what we call emergence, and that should be clear in everybody's mind. Now, if one to go to go a bit further, I have to, to, to say a few words about the mechanisms. Can we estimate the, the potential based on the mechanisms that we know? Um, this has been shown also by Scott a few minutes ago. Um, the, the first, I, I've chosen three mechanisms. I could not uh, show everything, of course. The first one is the one which is very popular that you find in the magazines and on the TV when, when, when talking about arboviruses. Very su a success story, really. It's anthropization of the transmission cycle, meaning that the virus goes from the forest to the cities. Um, this is a well-established model that has been based on, on the case of aedes born viruses, and this has been known now for decades, in particular first described for yellow fever virus. But it, to make a, l a long story short, this model says that some viruses have the potential to shift from a sylvatic cycle where they are in fact um, Sylvatic hosts, such as uh, non human primates, and sylvatic mosquitoes, into a urban cycle where they infect peridomestic uh, mosquitoes and humans. There are some bridging steps, but I, do, I don't insist um, on that. Um, what is important here is that this was first described for yellow fever, but yellow fever has not the potential to be uh, permanently. Uh, in a system sustainable manner uh, uh, transmitted in this urban cycle, meaning that each new outbreak of, of yellow fever will start again from the sylvatic cycle. 
but some other viruses have this potential. And these are the real success stories of emergence with this mechanism. Dengue, Zika, Chikungunya have massively spread because this cycle, this mosquito-human cycle, is very stable, very efficient, and it allowed them to emerge really massively. Okay, that was the first one. It's well known. It's, uh, it's quite well understood. Um, the second one is very different. Imagine a mosquito-borne virus that gives low viremia in humans, so the uptake by the mosquito is quite difficult, and therefore humans are dead and host. They do not transmit to mosquitoes. And imagine that um, this virus can be transmitted to humans only by mosquitoes that, with very severe restrictions, that, both, that, that are both onithophilic and atropophilic, meaning that they, they bite both um, birds and humans, and only if they have previously bitten an infected bird in the close environment of humans because such mosquitoes fly over short distances. So there are a lot of conditions. Be it, it doesn't seem very likely that this virus would be re responsible for a very high number of cases, uh, and especially in urban areas. But all of you know that this virus, this West Nile virus, was responsible for massive invasion of the, the, the North American continent. It infected a large panel of mosquitoes, birds, vertebrates, and finally provoked a very high number of human cases, and it even started in the urban environment. Let's be clear and honest, nobody pre predicted that, and that mechanism was not supposed to be an efficient mechanism before it happened. My third example is, um, the, the exact opposite of the first example I, I gave, which was from uh, forest to cities. He, here it's from cities to forest. The example is the example of tick-borne encephalitis. Um, tick-borne encephalitis has emerged in Europe, in specifically in, in, in Eastern Europe, at the end of the, s uh, of the, the 70s, and with a real enormous increase in TB uh, morbidity in, in the region. So this virus is typically... Um, uh, a sylvatic virus transmitted by, by exodus ticks, and you see that it includes the different um, um, stadial uh, um, inter <coughs> intermediates of the ticks and some rodents, etc. So nobody had anticipated this, but this increase was very important, and um, the possible explanations were um, modifications of the ecology of ticks, maybe linked to climate change with basically more ticks, more active and further north in Europe, and some socioeconomical and sociological um, um, factors that increased the contact of humans with ticks. In that period, there was a lot of poverty in, in Eastern Europe, and people went back to the forest to find uh, firewood, to, find, uh, to hunt, to find uh, uh, food, and they were exposed to ticks. And also, very differently, new leisure habits from urban populations that go for leisure into, into the forest. So the conclusion here is that things are not really simple. There is no systematic scheme of emergence for the, for the arboviruses. There are very different situations that led to emergence over time. And if we have a few accepted scenarios identified, there are many exceptions and many uh, counter examples. I will not develop too much here, but if you want during the questions um, after, I, I can give some uh, pra really practical examples of this. Um, uh, so my interpretation is that the actual precise mechanisms, mechanisms that lead to um, uh, uh, emergence remain essentially unknown, and we should be extremely modest. As uh, brilliantly shown by Scott in his presentation, we can uh, explain retrospectively some aspects of the biology and epidemiology of the viruses by uh, uh, observing uh, the viruses, their environment, etc. But it's another story to, to integrate data from biology, from virology, from immunology, from entomology, from environmental science, from sociology, etc to make a prediction. And all of these aspects are very important. Um, there was, uh, the, this morning, Mauricio showed, for example, the importance of the sociological, <coughs> sociological aspects, for example, for, for the vaccination or for, 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 for the way the people behave in front of uh, the arboviral risk. Okay, now uh, we know that var these viruses, the, 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 the 
the burden of re-emergence is something very important. So I think viruses that were previously identified as natural human or non-human primate uh, pathogens should be considered carefully because they are potential emerging agents. Here I have um, put two lists, the list of alpha viruses that have been previously uh, identified in, in monkeys and humans, and the list of flake viruses. The same thing can be done, for example, for Bunia viruses. In this list, in these lists, you can find viruses that you know very well and which are uh, classical re-emerging viruses, such as chikungunya, for example, uh, or dengue, uh, or, or Zika, or West Nile. But there are also many viruses which are completely understudied that we don't know very well and for which we don't have, for example, any uh, kind of diagnostic uh, uh, tools and any specific knowledge about their biology. And probably we have some important uh, potential candidates for emergence in this list. So this leads me quite logically to say a few words about diagnostic preparedness efforts. Um, According to what I have said, it should not be a big problem because we have a limited number of constantly re-emerging pathogens and it should not be so complicated to have good diagnostic for these pathogens. And then we have real emerging pathogens and I will say a few words about that. But the situation is paradoxical and very different from um, you what you may expect. For real emergence, um, the iconic example remains SARS and I think that um, we have, from 2003, a quite robust and still valid scenario that has been elaborated. What happened at this time, it has been uh, uh, detailed in a previous presentation, the pathogen is emerging, then efforts are made to identify this pathogen. And even in 2003, this was done quite rapidly and led to the identification of the, of the pathogen. I think that you know that in 2003, the, the, the tools were electron microscopy, uh, use of degenerate primers for amplification, etc. Nowadays, it would be probably done by NG NGS techniques, and it would be even faster. Whatever the technique, in the end, you have a genomic characterization, and from this genomic characterization, we are able to obtain nearly immediate release of real-time PCR techniques that can be made available to the medical community. So. The paradox here is that in a very uh, difficult environment of the emergence of a new pathogen, it is possible, and it has been shown in 2003, that it was possible to obtain quite good diagnostic, at least direct diagnostic, in a limited uh, amount of time. In, in, in that context, real-time PCR remains the major tool. Why? Because the, the design of the test is quite easy, it's very fast, and when you start with a, a pathogen that you don't know and you have any reference, any reference material, you know that you can obtain very rapidly an intrinsic high sensitivity and uh, sensitivity and specificity with real-time PCR. The other advantage, it's widespread and generic. It means that there is probably very few countries in the world where they, there is not at least one lab performing real-time PCR. And when you perform real-time PCR for any uh, specific usage, you can do it for a new pathogen. It's a generic technology. And finally, the reagents, um, the, the primers and probes, um, are, can be obtained really rapidly in days if necessary. Um, of note, the individual use of these tests requires positive and negative controls. This is very important for quality control, but also for standardization of, 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 of the data. And um, this is broadly available, in particular the European Virus Archive has been distributed uh, hundreds of such controls in the, ca in the case of MERS coronavirus during the, the emergence uh, period. And also um, enzymes and other reagents for uh, real-time PCR can, no can now be stabilized at room temperature, which is important because uh, they can be made available close to the cases. Um, I will not detail very much the, the issue of serology. All what I can say is that in a context of emergency, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to validate serological techniques in, in over a short period of time. Now, the case of re-emergence is very different, and I think that here 
we have invented uh, the perpetual movement. Um, what happens? A pathogen is re-emerging. Very rapidly, everybody sees that there are some diagnostic problems that can be identified. Som sometimes they are severe. Then after a few weeks or a few months, it is the end of the emergence event, the end of funding, and we are left with unfinished diagnostic programs. And we will restart from scratch at the, new, at, at, at the next re-emergence. That's the current situation, clearly. And I think that this situation is responsible for the very, very slow improvement of the situation in terms of diagnostics for emerging pathogens globally. So the reality is that for most of the, path the emerging pathogens, emerging viruses, even some very famous uh, pathogens such as dengue, chikungunya, zika, etc., we have poorly evaluated molecular tests and low performance serological tests. That's the truth. And for serious pathogens, um, we also need bedside inactivation of the samples. That would be extremely useful. Such protocols exist, but they are not internationally validated. I think they are requested. So in conclusion of, of, of this part, say that what is needed is preparedness, preparedness, and preparedness, meaning the capacity to improve systematically the diagnostic tools in peacetime and not during the outbreaks. Um, so we must find some formats to do that. One of the possible formats is this group in our working groups. I'm very happy to, to coordinate one of these groups on Chikungunya, on Nyong Nyong Mayaro. Um, the idea of these groups is to review for some uh, pathogens, emerging pathogens, uh, review and assess the, the current situation, identify the gaps of knowledge, and make some expert recommendations and sometimes produce some new tools. Um, this is currently being done for Chikungunya, Nyong Nyong Mayaro, and what I can tell you regarding diagnosis and epidemiology is that the general assessment is very bad. Our tests are not good. We don't have the right international controls that we would need. And uh, the specificity of, of, of the serological test is not, is not good. And we are talking of Chikungunya, but it, of course the situation is even worse for viruses such as Onyong Nyong and Mayaro. Don't think that this is details. This has led in the past, for example, uh, as uh, misidentifying some outbreaks in Africa that were identified as chikungunya, and it was Onyong Nyong. So it's, it's really something uh, important to develop. So to conclude, I, would, I, can, I cannot have better words than the words by, by, by Marion Koopmans in, in, in a recent uh, Lancet infectious disease paper. She wrote, there is clear need for a meaningful peacetime research response strategy defined as preparedness research in between the epidemics, leading to the development of strong and permanent global emerging disease uh, research capacity. I, I hope the GVM can be an active part of uh, uh, development of such a, a strategy. Thank you very much. <laughs>